hey, if you've got a Bible there, this collection of ancient documents that we've had bound together, uh, some of you've got it on your phone, that's okay, as long as you're not on Facebook or texting your friends. Um, if you do have a, uh, anything there that has these ancient documents on it, can you turn to Luke chapter 18 uh, for me this morning? We've, we started last week to talk about the topic of prayer. And I, I really believe that with all that we've gone through, um, and we're sort of you know, coming out the other end, I guess, but I, I look at, at what, what I believe I can see and, and sense that God is doing, and I talk to a lot of people. And it's amazing how some of the simplest disciplines of the Christian life no longer exist in a lot of people's worlds. I, I don't know whether it's because we think we're so advanced. You know, we're such an advanced society. We've moved beyond that. You know, we don't need that anymore. We know more. It's interesting. We feel like we know more about these ancient documents than the people that wrote them. Isn't that a strange sort of an idea that we would know more, that we can, we can change some of this stuff now and reinterpret words to make it more palatable to culture. Um, yet I go back and it's very clear that these guys actually lived a life that reflected what they kind of believed. So if they thought something was wrong, you generally see them not doing it or speaking against it, not going, well, how can we just sort of appease culture? Or how can we flip things around a little bit or make things a little bit, you know, uh, 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 less controversial or whatever. I don't see them doing that. And I also have this thing in my brain, and maybe you've noticed it too, there seems to be this correlation between the further away from what these ancient documents teach, the further we get away from them, there seems to be also a correlation with the lack of power that we see evident in the life of the church. Has anyone amen that statement? We, we, we've gotten sort of away from a lot of the simple basic truths and and you know what it's it's interesting that uh, even in church life today I think a, as a church in the west see we lived in India for a number of years and I've done ministry in other sort of Asian uh, nations or what we would call developing nations and what I notice in those places is that they have very little of the technology and very little of the pizzazz uh, very little of the deep theological thinking they have very little of uh, all the bells and the whistles yet when they gather together, we see healings, we see miracles, we see salvations, people turning from one way of life and surrendering and not just tacking Jesus on, by the way, uh, they realize there's a cost involved in following Christ, but they're prepared to pay the price and suffer the consequences because they want not just a God that comforts them in times of distress when they think about the presence of God, they want a God whose power and presence is actualized in their life. Amen? They want that. And so they give up this and they dive over here into Jesus. And it's amazing the things that you see and experience. And yet I can come back and many of you I know have traveled and you've been to different places. And many of you I know probably feel this way. And maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. There almost seems to be this correlation between the, the, the more uh, entertaining we feel like we need to make it when all the Christians gather together. Let's make it really entertaining for them to keep people focused. And I'm not against entertainment, not against any of that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is this, we're either depending on the power of God to make a difference in our world or we're going to be depending on everything else. And my experience is everything else just doesn't seem to work as well as God does. And so I keep wanting to go away from God. I keep wanting to try other things. I keep wanting to try other formulas and systems. I keep wanting to, to, to tell myself I don't really need to pray. It's not that important. I don't really need to read the Word of God. It's probably not that important. I don't really need to gather with other believers. It's not that important. I mean, I can just text them and stay in touch. I don't really need, I can just listen to a podcast and have somebody else explain these documents. I don't really need to pray. I'll just get on a prayer chain and somebody else can pray. And, and it's easy to want to go there, but there's something inside of me that keeps pulling me back going, you can go there if you want to, it's your choice. But if you really want to experience the reality of Jesus Christ in your life, the reality of God, then, hey, how about you try doing it God's way? Try doing it God's way. And, and so we're, we're talking at the moment about prayer. And we started last week, and I don't, I'm not going to tell you how many weeks we're going to go on this, but, but, but we're going to go for a few more weeks because I believe there's something incredibly powerful about prayer prayer. But yet it's amazing statistically when you look at how much time do believers, uh, particularly in the Western world, and I'm not picking on the West at all, I'm Western, I live here, uh, love the place, and uh, you know, have, we're blessed, all that stuff, I'm not having to go at the Western church, but what I'm saying is that, that it's amazing when you look at statistics, when they've done surveys, the average prayer time of a believer here in the West compared to the average prayer time of people in 
It's almost like when we feel like we don't have a need, we feel like we don't need God. When all my needs are met, and the government takes care of everything, and people say, and I'm, I've, I've got a level of prosperity. It's almost like, how many, how many of you remember September 11? Do you remember when the planes hit the, 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 the Twin Towers? Now, some of you will be too young to remember that. I remember we were working for you through the mission in Brisbane, and Jackie had actually organized to go into the middle of, of the city that particular day with a friend. And um, I think it was that day, wasn't it? She was going into the city with a friend. We lived in Mitchelton on the northern suburbs, working with uh, you through the mission. And I remember um, the base director's wife rang, rang me up and said, you need to go and turn the TV on. Look what's happening. I was getting ready to go in to, to run a class. Turned on the TV, and of course, we, we, we were glued to our TVs for a couple of days. Most of the Western world were watching what happened. But you know what they found just after September 11? There was such an incredible spike in America in purchase of Bibles. People went out and started buying Bibles like nothing. People started attending worship services, went through the roof. Because there was just something in a time of crisis and a time of need that there's this thing inside of us that draws us to a divine being in a time of need and a time of crisis. And and we're probably, every person in this room can probably attest to the fact when you're going through the mill, when you've got a, a difficulty that you know is beyond your intellect or capabilities, when you know you've exhausted every option, that is probably the time you've been on your knees and in prayer the most in comparison to other times when you felt like, okay, this might even be difficult, but I can handle it. There's something about being in need that keeps us dependent on God. And that's what prayer is. Prayer prayer for me is the ultimate act of humility. It's the ultimate act of humility where I come before a God that I can't physically see and I trust him in faith, not only to hear what I'm saying, but to be concerned enough to be doing something about it whether it be in me or in the circumstance itself. So we're talking about prayer. But let me preface again like last week, we're not talking about prayer so you can get information about prayer. Hands up again if you've ever read a book on prayer. For you, that's a lie. A lot more of you have read a book on prayer. Okay, exactly right. Pete's read too. He's got both hands going up. We've been to conferences on prayer. We've listened to podcasts on prayer. We've, we've had all kinds of information about, but gathering a whole bunch of information about something, if it doesn't translate to action, what's the point? What's the point? It's interesting. A friend of mine pointed something out to me this week that I thought was so profound. He said to me, he said, Alan, isn't it amazing? A man with a thousand demons recognized Jesus when he came into his presence, but men with a thousand scriptures didn't. I thought, I'm going to pocket that one and use that. Is that okay? He said, yeah, go for it. It's not patented. A man with a thousand demons, Jesus gets out of a boat, a man with a thousand demons, a legion of demons, sees Jesus, recognizes who he is, and gets set free. Yet the religious leaders who knew thousands of Bible verses were walking in the presence of Jesus trying to work out how can we get rid of this guy. So it's not about what we know. It's what we do with the Christian life that brings it alive. What are we putting into practice? And how many of you know there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't like? Are you like me? Am I the only person? There's a lot of things in here. If I'm brutally honest, I don't like them. I wish that I could get a big black Nico and just put a line through all the verses that I don't want to read a second time because I read them once and I don't like it. I don't want to die to myself. I don't want to do that. It just doesn't feel good and I don't like it. I don't want to love my enemies. I don't want to pray for those who spitefully. I don't want to do that. Nothing in my flesh wants to do that. But yet Jesus says, this is how we live life. And it's not until I start doing some of that stuff that then I begin to have my spiritual understanding awakened and I start to make the connection and go, okay, God, now I get it. Because with my natural human intellect, none of that, a lot of that doesn't make sense. Are you with me? A lot of this doesn't make sense. But when I begin to engage with it, then there's something happens and, and I get what Paul, uh, when Paul prays for the Ephesians, the eyes of their heart would be enlightened that they would get spiritual understanding. When I begin to do this stuff, all of a sudden I get spiritual understanding and I go, ah, oh, now I get it. My natural human brain doesn't get it, probably because it doesn't want to get it. Because <laughs> I don't want to do some of that stuff. But we've got to get back to what this word says. So we're on a bit of a journey at the moment, and we're talking about prayer. Bottom line, we're not talking about prayer so you can know something more about prayer. I will guarantee you this. The books you have read, the conferences you've been to, the podcasts you listen to, you're probably getting way better information than I'm going to be able to give you because they're probably way smarter than me. 
So I'll just surrender to that fact. What you've heard about prayer is probably way better than anything you're going to hear about prayer. But the thing is, if you haven't done what you've heard about prayer, maybe this time you will. Amen? Maybe this time we will. Luke chapter 18. And Jesus gives us, or Luke records a parable, a story that Jesus shared to to, to teach a point to a bunch of people. Luke 18, 1 to 8, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and to not lose heart. Last week we had a bit of a look at that part, always ought to pray, that, that, that there's so many admonitions in, in, in these ancient documents where people are saying to their audience, pray without ceasing, always pray. Pray. Pray about everything. In everything with prayer and petition. There's this sense in which there's a, 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 an underlying understanding from all these guys. They, in their time, knew that prayer was just something that you had to do. Prayer was something that if you were a believer, this is what you did. It's interesting if you go to Matthew chapter 6, and I think it might be Luke 12 maybe as well, somewhere around there, where Jesus uh, 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 teaches the disciples to pray. Anyone know that one? You know, who knows the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be. Yep, we know the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's interesting, especially Matthew records it really well. Matthew says, uh, he teaches about fasting and he teaches about prayer and, and he doesn't say, and if you pray. He starts, he starts by saying, and when you pray, pray like this. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm assuming that you're going to pray. So I'm not going to tell you. I'm, I'm assuming because it was already a part of their culture anyway. Prayer was a part of what they did, not only uh, uh, publicly, but individually. They prayed as well. It was a part of their culture. How many of you know prayer is not a part of Australian culture, really, is it? It's, it's not. It, it maybe, maybe go back some time. It used to be, but it's just not so much anymore. But that doesn't make it wrong. And that doesn't make culture right. Back in those days when God was moving and, and what we look at and we read and we get inspired and we go, Lord, God, I really, would you be to me today the God that you were to them back then? And God whispers back, I'll be the God I was to them when you be the people to me they were. They were devoted to me. They were committed. And they didn't mind having some spiritual disciplines in their life because not all discipline is, is bad. Discipline is a good thing, and not all spiritual disciplines are religious. You know, some people say, oh, you pray, oh, you're just being religious. It's funny. I can discipline myself in all kinds of areas in life, and nobody thinks there's anything weird about it. I exercise, I eat well, I go to the gym, I, I visit you know, your, your, your parents on a weekend, you have a Sunday lunch with them, whatever it is that you do, all these disciplines that we have, nobody dare look at us and go religious, but the minute you say something like prayer, reading the Bible, or going to church. You're being religious. Eh, why single them out? Why single those areas out? These things are important. They're important to the early church. And we looked last week at that, that, that men ought always to pray. As a matter of fact, that, that word in the Greek, always ought, where it says ought always to pray, it literally means it's a necessity decreed by God. That's literally what it means in the Greek. It's a necessity that's been decreed by God. So these people understood prayer to be something that was necessary and that God wanted. It was a part of what you did as a follower of God. In other words, prayer is really where you put your money where your mouth is. That's the way I say it. Anyone hear that phrase, put your money where your mouth is? Well, that's what prayer is to us as believers. Prayer is where we put our money where our mouth is. We can talk about dependence on God. We can say we trust God. But, but really, I think a, a lot of our faith is reflected in our prayer life. Do we trust God enough to prioritize time with him? to speak with him, to pour our heart out to him? Or is, is, is that something we don't have time for or something we don't see a need for? I want to just move on to the second part of, of what, what um, Luke said that Jesus' purpose for this parable was, um, that men always ought to pray and the second part and not lose heart. Then he goes on and he shares this amazing story. He says, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. So here's, here's I mean, this is a guy that, anyone got any friends like that? You're not going to put your hand up, are you? Because they might be, you don't want to judge. He doesn't sound like a good guy. He doesn't fear God or man. Now, there was a widow in that city. She came to him and said, get justice for me from my adversary. He wouldn't for a while. But after what he said within himself, though I don't fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I'll avenge her, lest by a continual coming she weary me. And then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? 
See, I don't think the Holy Spirit really wanted us to misinterpret the message. Many of the parables, you've got to try to work them out, don't you? You've got to think about them and put them in their context. And, and, and they had this one, it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit said, I don't want you to miss this one. The, the point of this one, I want it to, every generation between now when these documents are penned and, and I come back, I want everyone to understand the point of this one. You ought to always to pray and don't lose heart. I don't want to give you room to mess it up. I don't want to give theologians room to mess it up. I don't want to give, give, give cultures and centuries time to interpret it and, and twist it so it sounds better within the culture. or the fr- No, no, I want this message to be so clear. You always ought to pray. And when you pray, here's what I'm saying to you. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Let me ask you a question. Why would the woman in the story be tempted to lose heart? It's not a complicated question. Why would the woman in the story be tempted to lose heart? Here's the answer. If she felt like she wasn't getting anywhere, if she felt like nothing was happening or nothing was shifting. Why do we lose heart? Why do we lose heart when we pray? Why is it that we can start out so passionate before God, but then kind of drift off? You know what? I'll tell you, I think we're not much different to the woman. And I think that's part of what what, what Jesus is trying to tell us in the story. We're very much like the woman, aren't we? We can start with, with a, 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 a sense that this is right. We can bring our petitions to God. But when we feel like nothing's happening, anyone ever prayed for something and you just feel like nothing's happening and so you just give up? Be honest. I have. There have been things in my life where I prayed and prayed and I've got to a point where I just feel like nothing's happening. I feel like nothing's shifting. There's no movement. I'm not seeing or experiencing anything. And because of that, you know what? I can lose heart and I can just give up on that thing and not want to pray and not want to press in anymore. Human beings are human beings. This woman would have been tempted to give heart because she came back day after day after day to this guy. And guess what? On the surface, nothing's happening. On the surface, it looks like nothing's happening. It looks like nothing is shifting. But the truth is this, that there was a shift taking place, but it was taking place in a dimension that she couldn't physically see. Isn't that right? There was something happening... But she couldn't see that. So she would turn up each day, give me justice, give me justice. We don't know how long she did this. We don't know the time frame. It doesn't tell us. I think that's strategic too. Otherwise, we'd be the type of people to go, well, it only took two weeks. So if it's not two weeks, it's not God. And we've got to, no, no, so God, I'm not, not even going to give you a time frame. I'm just going to say to you, she kept persevering and persisting, and she got a result in the end. But she, she, if she had thought nothing was going on, But she kept coming, 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 but something was happening. Listen what it says in verse 3 to 5. It says, there was a widow in that city. She came to him, said, get justice. In verse 4, he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I don't fear God, nor regard man, but this widow is troubling me. He said within himself. In other words, there was was a shift taking place the minute she started praying. The minute she started coming to him, something happened. Now, she might not have seen it. She might not have experienced or perceived it. But it says right there that this judge is sitting there and internally he's getting discombobulated. There it is. I just love to throw that word out every now and then. Thank you, Seinfeld. He was getting discombobulated. Something was stirring inside of him and something was happening. She might not have seen it, but she didn't lose heart. How many of us lose heart? Because we're not seeing it. Well, she didn't lose heart because, you know what, I guess she realized that if I'm going to not lose heart, I've got to realize and believe something's happening when I come to this guy. Otherwise, I won't keep on coming. But, but I've got to believe that something's happening. That's why this Christian life is lived by faith. Faith is the substance of things, hopeful, evidence of things not seen. So many of us, Hebrews 11.6, right? It says without faith, it's what? Impossible to what? Please God. Okay, because he who comes with him must believe that he is, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. How many of you think that God wants you to live a life that's pleasing to him? Yeah? So you think that, okay, God wants me to live a life that's pleasing to him, and so do I. I'll double amen. I think God wants me to live a life that's pleasing to him, right? But without faith, that would be impossible. So if God wants me to live a life that's pleasing to him, doesn't it make sense that he's going to make sure there are big fat faith spaces in my life that I can walk in because that's pleasing to him? Yeah? If without faith I can't please him, but he wants me to please him, how come some of us are going, God, just I want a life that's devoid of faith spaces. I want everything mapped out. I want to see everything. I want to know everything. I want all the answers laid out in the platter. I want to be able to not think about any of that. I just want to think about other things in life. I want a life where I don't need faith, but without faith, you can't please God. You can't have it both ways. What do you want? What do we want? 
I want a life that pleases God. So guess what? I've just got to accept the fact that I'm going to have to live a life of faith. And I'm just going to have to trust God at certain times. And prayer is one of those biggies where I've just really got to trust that God's doing stuff and that things are shifting and things are moving. Always pray and don't lose heart. Losing heart means to be utterly spiritless, to be wearied out and to be exhausted. And I'll bet you there are some people here and you've stopped praying or maybe you've just stopped with certain petitions. Some of you are praying for children to come back to the Lord. Some of you are praying for, for, praying for husbands and wives maybe to, to get through difficult times or, or maybe to come to, to faith in Christ as well. Some of you are praying for breakthroughs at work. Some of you are praying. There are things that have been laid on your heart that you know are right, that, that God's put on your heart, that you prayed for, but, but, but maybe you, you got to a point where you became exactly as, as this word means, you became utterly spiritless, you began to be wearied out, and you started to get exhausted. Well, my prayer today, and through this, this series here, is I want to kick those people and say, come on, come on, stand back up. Stand back up. Get that prayer list, get that pen, get that paper. Start putting some time aside, find some, and start bringing those things back to God because you have a Father who loves you and cares for you. And prayer is such an important part of the Christian life. It really, really is. It's an important part of our world. In places that were hidden from this woman's sight, there were changes that were already taking place in her life. I remember when I was a kid, my, uh, my, I used to live in a place called Claymore. Anyone know where Claymore is? Just out of interest. I didn't think so because nobody knows it and, nobody, and the people that know it don't want to know it. It was a little uh, sort of housing commission place established in the western suburbs of Sydney just outside of Campbelltown back when I was a kid. And basically they were giving away you know, rent for $3 a week. I think that's how we got there. And uh, so we moved into that community and uh, my cousin uh, lived over in Mount Druitt. Who knows where Mount Druitt is? Yep. Yeah, yes, I'm a Westie. Proud. Um, and, and so my cousin lived in Mount Druid. One of the big joys of my life when I was a kid was that my cousin, my uncle and auntie would bring my cousin around to visit me. They would get in the car at Mount Druid and they would drive from Mount Druid all the way across to Claymore, um, just outside of Campbelltown there, and we would, you know, kick footballs. And, and he was my, not only my cousin, but he was my best friend. And so I, I, I used to love it when Jeff, my cousin Jeff, would come and visit me. And, and so what would happen is the day that he was coming, say it was a Sunday morning, or whatever, I'd be out the front of my house and I'd be standing there as little kids do just standing there looking down the end of the street just waiting for the uh, old Kingswood they had a Kingswood uh, just waiting for the air all the old air I was just waiting for the old brown Kingswood to come around the corner and I could see and I'd be waving at Jeff and he'd beat the window jumping out the window before the car stopped and we'd have a wonderful time praying together and we'd both burst into tears when Jeff had to go home but how many of you know that I would stand there and I would look and I would look and I would look at one point, the car would come around the corner, maybe 100 metres down the road. All of a sudden, it would come around the bend and I'd see. How many of you know that they began their journey to get to me way before I ever saw the car come around the corner? Way before I ever saw that car with my physical eyes, had any physical evidence that they were on their way. Before I ever saw that, there was a whole bunch of things going on. At some point, they made the decision. Maybe it was a week before they, they, they rang up my parents, my, my dad, mum, whatever, and said, we're coming around to see you on Sunday. So, so they already made the decision. Then maybe they waited a week, and then on Sunday, they got in the car. And then maybe they drove uh, down the road, and then maybe they got a kilometre down the road, and remember, they forgot something. So maybe they turned around and drove back. And got it. And they got back in the car and they're driving along. Then maybe there was a traffic accident that slowed them down. Then they got through the accident and they kept on going. Then maybe my cousin got car sick, which he did all the time. And maybe they had to pull over so that he could be, do, he could be car sick. And then they got him back in the car and then they drove along and a whole bunch of other things happened before they got to me. They didn't start the journey at the moment that I actually saw them. They were already moving. Something was happening before I ever saw that car come around the corner. Amen? There was, there was movement, there was action, there were things happening before I ever saw them. And because I knew they were coming, because I trusted and knew, guess what? I didn't lose heart. I didn't go throw my hands in the air and go, well, blow this. I'm going to, down to the creek and catch wheels or go and do something else. Because oh, there's no way I was going to miss my cousin rocking up and us having some fun together. So I was not losing heart. I sat there the whole time. Why? Because I actually believed, even though I can't see the car, I believe they're on their way. I believe something's happening that I can't see right now, but I believe it's happening so much so that it's meaning I'm going to stand on this corner. Even if they're two hours late, I would still be standing there and I'd be waiting. Might have looked like an idiot. I didn't care, but I would stand there because I believe with all my heart. They said they're coming and they're coming. 
And you know what? Prayer's a little bit like that. The, the, the prayer didn't, God doesn't just go, okay, you want something, you pray, 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 and bang, there's the answer straight away, smack. The minute you see it, that was the first time God did something. How many of you know, when we pray, things happen in the unseen world, things happen that, that we're not aware of, we're not seeing straight away, that, and the journey is beginning and stuff's come. And if we would really believe that, then that would go a long way to helping us not lose heart in this thing we call prayer, amen? Amen. If we really believe that, then, then that would help us not lose heart in prayer. So what I want to do, just to finish up, just give you four real simple things that I believe happen when you start to pray. Just as the, the widow, she didn't lose heart because she knew she must have had faith. She didn't see it, but something was happening inside of the judge. She didn't see nothing, but she didn't lose heart. She didn't see nothing, but she kept coming back. She didn't see nothing, but she must have had faith that something was happening and she wasn't wasting her time. So she kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And eventually, she got to see the answer. And that's a great picture of what prayer is like for us. Don't lose heart. Believe that things are going on when you begin to pray. Don't be somebody that says nothing's happening until I see it. Until I see it. I don't believe anything's happening. Hey, the world is bigger than your eyes and ears. How many of you know that? You know there's a lot of things happening right now that you're not seeing. Does that mean they're not happening? Hey, do you know what my three sons are doing right now? I don't. I can't see them. Does that mean they're doing nothing? Nothing's happening? Do you know what's happening in South Korea right now? Does that mean nothing's happening? Everyone's just sitting down going, oh, I'm not going to move until one of them are looking at us. I don't want them to miss it. Stuff's going on all the time that we don't know about. Stuff's happening all the time around us. Well, it's no different with prayer. And I just want to give you a few things to have a think about. With prayer, the pictures that we see. Uh, number one, Daniel chapter 10, we get this great picture of Daniel fasting and, and praying. And you probably all know the story. I'm not going to tell you anything new today. I just want to give you a boot with some old stuff and say, I don't care that you knew it. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. Then he said to me, this is Daniel, he has this vision and he's, he's seeking understanding on this vision. It has to do with the nation of Israel. And then this big angel uh, appears to him, uh, messenger appears to him. It says, then he said to me, do not fear Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your what? Your words were, who knows the story? From the minute you set to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I've come, why? Because of your words. I've come because of your words. In other words, I, I, I might be sitting back on a beach in Jamaica under a palm tree right now, but you said something, you prayed, you saw God on something, and so here I am. Here I am. Why? Because you said something. But what's interesting, he said from the first word you said, the minute you started something happened in a realm that Daniel was totally unaware of. Something happened the minute Daniel began to pray. And, and, and the minute you begin to pray, guess what? Something happens. The minute you begin to pray, something happens. Don't lose heart. Imagine if Daniel had have lost heart. And what's the rest of the story? It says, from the minute your words were heard, I've come to you because of your words. Verse 13, what's this? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. No theologian completely understands what that means. We don't know what it means. What we do know is this, that it wasn't something on the natural earth. It wasn't something on the natural earth. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I'd been left alone there with the kings of Persia. In other words, we're getting this picture that, Daniel, you began to pray. And when you started praying, the wheels began to spin in motion to bring an answer. But there was a battle going on between me and where I was and where you were. We were trying to bring this to you, but there was a battle going on. There was something happening in the unseen realm. As passionate as what God is to get good things to you, how many of you know the devil is just as passionate to keep good things away from you? As passionate as God is to want to speak to his children, the devil is as passionate in the same degree to want to stop you from getting those words, stop you from hearing, and stop you from becoming. It's just the reality. And, as, and if you're not a Christian here today, and I don't know everybody here, um, our worldview is that there's more to life than you can see, taste, touch, feel, and smell. And you know that. Because you've had those moments where you've been walking around at night, maybe you got up to go to the toilet, and you're standing there, and the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, and you feel like there's something in the room. You look around with your natural eyes, there's nothing there. You listen with your natural ear, there's nothing there. But you know, 
Well, well that's, that's what we would refer to as the spiritual dimension that's working at the same rate, same time as what this is. It's, it, it's, there's stuff going on around you right now. How many of you know that in this room right now, there are probably cops chasing robbers? You know that? There are policemen chasing robbers in this room right now. It's true. Did you know there's a horse race happening in this room right now? There are horses running. Do you know? Don't look at me like I'm dumb. Did you know it's happening? It really is. Did you know two people are falling in love? I hope that's not prophetic. Well, I hope it is. Maybe it is prophetic. There are people falling in love. There are people fighting. There are two guys punching into each other, right? And it's all happening in this room right now. And if we took that little box up the back there, we stuck a TV antenna on it, you'd be able to bring all that to the physical world and you'd be able to see it. But it's all flying through right now, but you need this thing called a television antenna to pick it all up. But it's just flying around the room, being picked up by TV sets and radios and all kinds of things. There's other dimensions other than what we see, taste, touch, feel, and smell. And as believers, we believe that there is a spiritual dimension. And, and, and prayer, part of, part of prayer is prayer is a battle. And, and, and God wants to get things to you just like here. This angel comes to Daniel and says, from the minute you started to pray, I began to come. But there was a battle. And Daniel kept on praying, kept on praying. Maybe Daniel didn't even realize what was happening with his prayers. But I'll tell you what the picture tells me. Daniel's prayers were a part of winning that battle. Imagine if Daniel had have stopped after 18 days. It says 21 days, this angel. What if he stopped at 18 days? I don't know. All I do know is that his prayer is somehow indicated as part of the reason why this angel was able to break through and finally get there and come to Daniel. And then he begins to explain and give Daniel the answer that Daniel was seeking. There's a, there's a, there's a warfare aspect to our prayer. So when you pray... When you pray, I want you to picture that. I want you to imagine that the enemy is there and he's trying to push against your answer and God's using your prayers to push back. God's using your prayers to push back. Stuff happens in the spiritual dimension. Second thing, Acts chapter 12. We've got this great story in Acts chapter 12, verse 5 to 11 about Peter. Peter's being kept in prison. Um, James, the bro- uh, uh, I think it was, it was James or John, one of them, the brother of Jesus, had just been killed by Herod. And so Herod grabbed, Herod saw that it made the Jews happy, so he grabs Peter, puts Peter in prison, and he's actually going to kill Peter. So here's Peter in prison on death row. He's going to be murdered. And, and, and what happened was the church got together and the church prayed for Peter. They prayed for Peter. Watch what happens. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer. I love that word, constant, not just a one-off. No, we're going we're gonna to push. Why are we going to keep pushing? Well, because we realize there's warfare going on as well. So we're going to use our prayers, and we're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, these parents about to bring him out and kill him, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Verse 7, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up and said, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself, tie on your sandals. So he puts his Nikes on. And, and, and he did it. And he said, Put on your garments and follow me. So he went out and followed him. And Peter, the whole time, Peter doesn't even know this is really going on. Isn't that weird? The whole time, Peter didn't even know what was going on. He didn't know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first gate and the second guard post, they came to an iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. They went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. The second thing that happens when we pray, first thing is that, that, that there's a battle going on. The second thing that happens in that unseen realm is that angels go into action. Angels going to action. This angel turns up as a response to the prayers that these people are praying. Who believes in angels? I believe in angels. You know, when I first became a Christian, 19 years of age, I, I was sitting in a, uh, I went to a little uniting church in Ballina. Um, and uh, my idea of church back then, I didn't do the morning ones. I, I went in the afternoon and we had the, um, the pews and they put them in a triangle. And we had a guy, I can't even remember his name, Jeff Thomas. A guy called Jeff Thomas, and he had a guitar. And me and my mates, uh, we would go to the beach, and we would come, we would dive out of the surf uh, just two minutes before church. We'd run off Sunday uh, at six o'clock, and we'd walk in there, no shoes, her hair still wet, no shirt on. Uh, but he, they didn't care. We'd sit on the pews with our wet pants, uh, and, and then he would, Jeff would say to us, "So, what do you want to sing?" And that was it. That's what I thought. And people would pick a song and we'd sing a song. I remember one night, very early in my, my walk with God, I'm sitting there and I bowed my head and I closed my eyes and we were singing a song and I saw a picture. 
And in this picture, I saw an angel. And, and, and I'm, I, I know it was an angel. I'm not a person given to that kind of stuff. But, but I just had this picture of this angel right there. And boy, wasn't this angel awesome. I'm not talking some little pixie flying around in a... In a you know, I, I saw an I saw a, 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 a angel there that, that was protective. That was, it was like a soldier uh, uh, ready for command. And I wonder whether that's what this angel looked like. I don't know. But Peter saw this angel. But Peter said, uh, because constant prayer has been prayed. And, and when you start praying, there are, angelic, there are angels there. Here's what Hebrews, here's what the writer of Hebrews says about angels. He says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? See, part of the book of Hebrews was that this bunch of believers are thinking of ditching Christianity, going back to Judaism, because, because the pressure and the persecution of following Christ was getting to be too much. So they were thinking, we'll go back to the old Jude- Judaic system, Hebrew system with the worship and the sacrifice and everything. So the entire book of Hebrews is really a warning to them, don't go back, and here's why you don't go back. Jesus is better than Moses. The new covenant is better than the old. And he just goes through this series of, of of exhortation to them saying, don't, don't go back, stay the course, stay the course. And, and, and there were sections within Judaism where they actually, on fri- there were fringe sections of Judaism that worshipped angels. They worshipped angels. So part of the thing he's saying here is, is, hey, Jesus is even above the angels. What are angels? Angels aren't the ones that died for you on a cross, but angels are, are spirits. They're, they're, they're part of God's plan that God sends to minister to you. Think about that. There, there, there are angels. When you pray, there are angels that get released to go and do the bidding of God and do the things that God wants done. Number three, the third thing that happens is that God actually communicates with us when we pray. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 and 9, Paul writes this. He says, concerning this thing, everyone know about Paul's thorn in the side? Yep, yep, Paul talks about having this thorn, this messenger of Satan. Again, it's one of those things that theologians will disagree on. Nobody knows exactly what that thing was or is or whatever, but... I'm not going to worry about that right now. Let's have a look at what Paul says happened as a result of that. As a result of that, he prays. He says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So here's Paul's prayer. Take it away. Paul's prayer is, God, take it away. Take it away. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, and this is now Paul. Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I'll rather boast in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, Paul started out praying, saying, take this thing from me. God spoke to Paul. Paul's prayer changed. Paul's prayer changed. And we're going to talk about this in coming weeks. What exactly is prayer? Prayer is not a means by which I go to God to get what I want. Prayer is a means by which God comes to us to get what he wants. Amen. That's what prayer is. That's what biblical prayer is. And we'll talk about that down the track. But what I want you to see here is that God does answer prayer. Paul went to God asking for a a deliverance, a healing, whatever it is. Paul wanted that. And how many of us, we go to God and we say, this is what we want. Here's here's the reality. We get answered. God does answer us. The truth is that most of us are not looking for an answer from God. We're looking for the answer, aren't we? The answer that we've already determined, this is the answer. So God, I'm going to come to you, but this is the answer. I'm not coming saying, Lord, you know, God, shape my prayer, mold me, show me what you want to do in this situation. No, no, this is the answer. And I wonder how many times God has answered our prayers, but we're not looking for an answer, we're looking for the answer. And we didn't get the answer, so prayer doesn't work. Garth Brooks had a a song many years ago. Any Garth Brooks fans here? Garth Brooks had a song, and the song was, um, uh, the the chorus goes, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. And and I I, I don't agree with the word, but I love the sentiment of it. Because the truth of the matter is, there's no such thing as an unanswered prayer. That's my opinion. I believe God answers prayer. Sometimes he says yes, Sometimes he'll say no. Sometimes he'll say not yet. Sometimes he'll say later. Sometimes he'll say, I've got a few things to do first before that. That's the reality of relationship. And that's why it's a relationship with God, not a dictatorship where we tell, we're the dictator telling him this is how it's going to be, God. We miss a lot because we don't realize that prayer is a place of humility where we humble ourselves to get understanding. So that because God, I want your will to come. I remember being in India many uh, years ago and uh, we used to go out to this little village and we planted a church with some Indian pastors out in this village and uh, we saw amazing miracles, signs, wonders, healings. And I remember one night in particular, this lady came in and she walked up and they brought her up to me and said, you need to pray for this sister. She's got demonic stuff going on and all this stuff. And I remember stepping up to her and I went to lay my hands on her to pray for her. And as I did, I looked down at her left arm and I noticed she had this piece of leather around her left arm. Now everybody wears stuff. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit in that moment said to me, don't pray for her, ask her about that. 
So normally, you know, God wants to heal everybody, doesn't he? Yeah. So I would just launch into prayer, would you heal this person? Well, I pulled my hand off, I stepped back and I said, can I ask you a question? What's with that piece of letter there? And I said to the interpreter, can you ask? So the interpreter asked, okay, what's this? She said, well, I went to, this morning I went to my witch doctor. And my witch doctor gave me this piece of leather and said that if I put this leather on, that, the, that their God will heal me. And straight away, I knew what's going to happen here. If I pray for you and you get healed, you know who you're going to say did it? You're going to... So I felt like the Holy Spirit said, don't pray for you. He literally said to me, don't pray for her right now. So I said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to pray for you. I want you to go away. I want you to keep that thing on for the next two weeks. And I want you to see what happens. And if nothing happens in two weeks, you come back to me and we take that off and I'll pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ. And she said, no worries. She went away. Two weeks later, uh, we're back there again. We're in the middle of a meeting. She marches in. She grabs a knife. She just ripped that thing off her hand and said, would you please pray for me? We prayed for her. She was healed in that moment, set free from all this stuff. We've got to learn to cooperate with God in that place of prayer. And many of us don't think of prayer that way. So many of us have been brought up thinking prayer is the way that I get from God what I want. And so I petition God for what I want. I don't get what I want. I lose heart. I walk away. Prayer doesn't work. What's the point? What I'm trying to show you here today is that, that when we pray, stuff definitely, definitely, unequivocally, 100% happens. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Paul starts by praying, God, heal me. God communicates with him. Paul's humble enough to accept. And instead, Paul goes from take this thing away and he completely changes it and goes, I'm going to boast in this thing, Lord. Aren't you awesome? Aren't you great, God? Your grace is sufficient for me. But he got an answer, and I believe God always, always answers our prayers. We've just got to listen for the answer, uh, listen for an answer from God, and not be bogged down on the answer. Because let's, let's be honest, sometimes I don't know everything, so I don't really know what the answer should be. I'm so grateful that I have a God that knows a lot more about my life and the world than I do. God communicates with us in that moment. Fourthly, uh, your spiritual muscles are strengthened. Every single time you pray, your spiritual muscles... Are, how many of you know your spirit is like a muscle? I'm not saying it's a muscle, go and get an MRI and they can tell you if there's a tear in it. Not that kind of muscle. But your spiritual life, your spirit, uh, uh, it can be strengthened or weakened. Just like a natural muscle. I want you to imagine that, that you've got uh, two dumbbells, right? And you've got one in your right hand, one in your left. And, 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 and every time you, you pray, I want you to imagine that you're grabbing that spiritual... That arm with the spiritual muscle and you're just... And every time you don't, every time you just think you're working out yourself, or you're, then, then you, you flex the other one. After a while, you know what happens? You end up with one really, really strong flesh muscle and your spirit muscle is totally weak as water and you can't do anything with it. It's not that it's not there, it's that you don't exercise it. It's that you don't do those disciplines, that you don't prioritize that muscle in your body so it doesn't strengthen and it doesn't get any bigger. When I was 19, I was playing rugby union um, for Ballina, I think, actually, and I was a halfback in rugby union. Any rugby union fans, players? Yep, a couple. So, his, his, so I was the halfback. So my job pretty much most of the game was to run to where all the meatheads were jumping on top of each other. When the ball came out the bottom, pass it to the 5'8". That was, that was kind of what I did most of the game, you know. But the thing is, I could pass really, really good right to left, but it, passing left to right, I was really, really bad at it. So what my coach said is, here's what we're going to do, Alan. We are going to make sure that when we get there for the first 15 minutes and everyone else is huffing and puffing, because I was pretty naturally fit anyway, let them go and do all the huff and puff stuff. You come over here with me, and I'd do 100 passes right to left, 100 passes. Then I'd turn 100 passes left to right. And I'd do that every training session before every game. I'd, rack up, you know, I'd probably rack up four, 500 passes on my bad side every single week. Uh, but you know what happened eventually? I, I started racking up the passes. Now I can pass just as good from my right to my left as I can my left to my right even though when I first started it felt so gammy it felt so unnatural it felt ugly I didn't like doing it I felt uncoordinated it felt weird but now you know what it's as natural as passing the other way and prayer can feel like that for many people too prayer can feel like this weird unnatural thing I'm going to go and I'm going to sit somewhere and I'm going to speak to Casper the friendly ghost who I can't see and I'm going to tell God things and by the way God you're supposed to know everything anyway so what's the point it's not like I'm going to surprise you with anything <laughs> Why do I have to? And prayer can feel like a really unnatural discipline to begin with for people. And I know that because a lot of people, when they first come to faith and I talk to them about prayer, it's, it's amazing how hard it is for a person to get a prayer life started. But let me tell you something. I know it's difficult and feels gummy. But if you will discipline yourself and start it, here's the beautiful thing. Once you do something enough, it becomes a habit. And when, you, when something becomes a habit, how many of you have noticed? The reason something's a habit is because it's taken on a certain amount of momentum. 
Persistence is when you've got to keep providing all the momentum. But once it becomes a habit, habit is where the momentum is provided for you. Now it's just natural. Now, now, now I do it. Now I eat healthy. When I started eating healthy, it was really, really hard, but now it's just natural. When I first started exercising, I hated it. I couldn't discipline myself. I always found something else to do. Now I want to do it. My body wants to do it because it's in this, this habit. And, and, and prayer is a good, good habit. And it's a discipline that we need to develop in our lives. And every time we do, I want you to imagine, every time you pray, I want you to imagine that you're doing this with your spiritual muscle. <sighs> And we need to be strong spiritually. God wants us to be strong spiritually. So there's four things uh, that happen when we pray. I don't want you to lose heart. When you pray, spiritual battles are being fought. When you pray, angels go into action. When you pray, God is communicating to you. We've got to learn to hear. And when you pray, your spiritual muscle is being strengthened. That's the reality of what happens when we pray. And if we can grab a hold of just those four simple little things, none of them are probably new to you, but they're all biblical. They're all there. You can go back, have a look at them yourself. If you could, every time you sat down and prayed, if you would tell yourself that, I'm flexing my spiritual muscle right now, something's happening. Angels are going into activation. Something's happening. I'm pushing back spiritually in the battle something's happening if, if we could just hang on to the fact that, that, that when we pray stuff happens then we'd find ourselves in a way better position to not actually lose heart let me close with this verse Micah chapter 7 and verse 8 Micah chapter 7 verse 8 says this it says do not rejoice over me my enemy for when I fall I will arise when I stumble I'm going to get back up when I give up, I'm going to start up again. When, I, when things don't go my way and I drop my head, I'm going to lift it back up. When I drop my bundle, I'm going to gather my sticks, put them back on my shoulder, and I'm going to keep on marching. I'm going to arise again. And I just I feel like I want to encourage some of you. There are things that you have been praying for and, and, and things in your heart Family members that you've just stopped praying for because you're not seeing anything. And maybe what you're seeing makes you think that everything's going in the opposite direction. Trust me, I've got, I've got um, uh, uh, plenty of things. I've got children that I pray for. And you know what? It, it, sometimes it can look like everything's going in the opposite direction, but then every now and then you'll hear something. God will just, if you persevere and you stick at it, every now and then God will just, it's like he throws this little carrot past me and goes, hang on a second just to keep you going. Like you're digging your heels in, you're believing in faith, you're believing in faith. I'm just going to give you a little something just to prep you up and just to, to keep you going. Because when we pray, stuff does happen. And there are people here and you've stopped praying for things that are really, really important. They're on the heart of God. God's downloaded them to you and he wants you to pick them back up and start praying again. He wants you to start praying again. It's time to stand back up. You've got to get up and start praying again. You've lost heart. The devil's resistance has beaten down your persistence. And it's time to make the choice to rise up and pray again. Prayer works. In fact, it's so obvious, prayer so obviously works that I'm going to say this to you. To not pray is the greatest waste of your time. To not pray is the greatest waste of your time. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, he said this. He said, the power of prayer can never be overrated. They who cannot serve God by preaching need not regret if a man can but pray, he can do anything. He who knows how to overcome with God in prayer has heaven and earth at his disposal. Don't lose heart, people. Let's be a people of prayer. Pick up some of those prayers. Start praying again. I'm going to finish up now and pray for us, but here's what I want you to do. I want you, if you feel like the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, I want you to grab somebody after we... after. I'm going to pray and we're going to go tea and coffee next door, all that stuff. I want you to do something. Don't sit there and go, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just sit with that because you know what happens. By the time you get home and have lunch, it'll kind of dissipate. 
If the Spirit's speaking to you about your prayer life, I want you to go to somebody and I want you to say, hey, I just want to say to you that here's what I feel like God's saying to me and I just want to say to you, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up my prayer life again. I'm going to start praying again for this. Would you, would you even, even maybe next week, would you ask me, how am I going? Have I been praying for my husband, my wife, my children? Have I been praying for that job? Or have I been praying about that book that's in me that I'm trying to get? It? Have I been praying for my neighbours that, that I, I, I haven't come to faith yet? Have, I, have you been praying? Why don't you do that? Why don't you make yourself a little vulnerable, a little accountable and share with somebody hey this is what I believe God said to me would you pray for me amen amen a little bit frightening I know but the Christian life is meant to be done together but in isolation it's not me and God it's me God and you that's how I get the most out of it Father I want to thank you for this morning Lord I want to thank you for your word God, I want to thank you even now, Lord, as we're praying. God, there are angels that are moving about the place. God, even now as I'm praying, there is resistance, there is warfare. Lord, you are pushing back the forces of darkness. God, you're using this prayer to do things, God. Father, even now as I pray, my muscle, my spiritual muscles, God, they're flexing, Father. And God, I want to pray for each person in this room right now. Lord, I pray that you would stir in our hearts a fresh passion for prayer. God, stir in our hearts a fresh desire to want to find the time, make the time, and to sit with you and to be with you, to pray, Father, to engage in that two-way conversation, Lord. God, to humble ourselves before you. God, to, to make room, God, as an act of faith by saying, you know what, we can't do life without you, God. We, 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 we need you, not just for salvation, God. We need you for life. And so, Father, I just pray that for each person here. And God, I also pray as we leave this place today, in the next seven days, God, as we leave here, Father, uh, everyone here that has bowed their knee to Jesus, I pray, would you give us an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with somebody out there, God, somebody out in our community, our neighbours, our friends, somebody out there that right now has no idea that, that you love them, has no idea what Jesus Christ did for them, has no idea that salvation, freedom, liberty, grace is awaiting them. There's an invitation there with their name on it. Father, give us a chance to be the people to tell them about you in the next seven days, Father. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.